12, even observed people uh, on this trip. I learned things by watching people, listening to people, and then thinking about what I heard and saw. Um, so we have the example of Jesus doing this in the house of a ruler of his synagogue, one of the Pharisees, uh, Luke 14. Uh, he, of course, went to eat bread with them, and uh, uh, it says that those rulers watched him closely. Well, he also observed them. As verse 7 says, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places. So Jesus is well aware of what we do. He's in our midst, uh, like first, uh, Revelation chapter 1, really the first three chapters, you know, I know your works. Um, we can't fool Jesus. We can fool ourselves, and we can fool others maybe. And because we can fool others, we often fool ourselves, but we cannot fool Jesus. But he is observing what we do each and every time we meet. And, of course, we uh, have the promise that he is with us if we are gathered together in his name. Um, <clears throat> First Timothy 4, 16 also tells the, the preacher, Paul tells the preacher, Timothy, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So I'm aware that I'm being washed, I'm being listened to. And, and earlier, verse 11 said, be an example to everyone in faith and purity and love and uh, several other things there. So I, I did observe things. I learned things from other people, and um, it was not a vacation. It was not a tax-deductible business trip. In other words, I was not invited by a congregation to go, and all my expenses were um, deductible because I, I was taking a business trip of some sort. Um, it was family business. and could be summed up in, uh, say, in a wedding and two burials. Um, but while we were down there, we met many people, made new friends, and um, mutually encouraged by new ones and old ones, and also family, relatives, uh, visiting a lot of uh, Ellen's uh, relatives, both on her mother's side and her uh, father's side. And, uh, of course, Hebrews 3.13 says we're to encourage one another daily, uh, and that's something I want us to, to keep in mind. Uh, another thing about it is with a whole lot of things to accomplish, significant things. One thing took at least 17 years to accomplish. Um, we were able to get done what we went to do. Um, so I, I feel real good about that. Uh, I'm uh, thankful to the Lord for that. Um, Jesus in John 4:34, uh, obviously in the in the class. Uh, in the previous class, and it was mentioned again this, this morning from John 4 about Jesus, um, it was so important for him to do the will of God. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, in verse 34. And uh, then at the end, the night before he died, right before his betrayal and arrest, he says, I have accomplished the work which you have given me to do. And then on the cross, he said, it is finished in chapter 19. Um, we made a promise when we went to Florida to go to Romania. This was 29 years ago, um, and it took 17 years to fulfill it because that's when um, I paid off the mobile home that we were living in. The, the, Ellen watched uh, one of the children, and they were catty corner behind us, and they had a vacant lot right behind where we were staying. They paid to move it, set it up. And that way we didn't have to pay lot rent as we were still making payments on our mobile home. But once the mobile home was paid for, because they were doing that and saved us so much money over the years, we had promised that we would deed it over to them for, for that boy and, and his mom. Uh, and the parents had owned, owned that lot. So uh, when we got it paid off, we got a letter, no title, and it has taken 17 years to get all the paperwork done in order to get a title in order to, to turn that over. So, you know, Psalm 15, four talks about one who is able to be on God's holy hill. It is one who makes a promise or swears to his own hurt. And so that's something that um, uh, we, we, it's important to keep our word. And so that's an important thing we got done uh, really the first part of the trip. 
Uh, while we were on the East Coast, I tried to visit some folks we knew from that area. Uh, one in particular I uh, was hoping to see, but he had died just a few months before. And I was talking to the lady about him and, you know, who he was and his past and how interesting it was. Um, he mentioned uh, about him being baptized in the Atlantic Ocean. He was born with cerebral palsy. He was deathly afraid of water, but when he made the choice to obey the gospel, he was not afraid to go into the water. And of, we didn't have a baptistry. I see we have one now. <laughs> um, but, you know, the ocean is not just, you know, still water. It, it's, there are waves, and there's an undertow. And, and uh, so I, I was thinking about how, how is this going to happen, and... and uh, so the Lord helped to baptize him because I waited right, right at the right time when a wave would come over him, and he, he was completely immersed at that point. And someone helped me actually get him out of the water. But uh, that, 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 um, he had an interesting life. He, he was part of the Monday Night Crew when it first started, Monday Night Football. Um, he worked for ABC uh, because of Kurt Gowdy, got him hooked up with um, some friends and and even though Kurt Galley was on NBC, he got him uh, a job. And so he, he's somebody who obeyed the gospel through here in our radio program uh, in Daytona Beach uh, many years ago. And I try to visit him every time I had a chance. And there are other Christians who would visit him when, when he had to go into a nursing home there in uh, Daytona Beach. We worshiped at New Smyrna Beach. Um, and Marianne and Gabby Oltbosch, uh, they were there. He's preaching, and uh, so he, 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 he taught the lesson on, on Sunday. We got to eat with them, and he showed me some pictures of uh, three guys who were living in Romania at the time that we moved over there, um, and they went back for a visit for a couple of weeks. Uh, their names are Buddy Payne, Kerry Keenan, and Brent Forsyth, and they are all preaching at congregations in Central Florida, so more about them in a minute. Um, that evening, I was looking for a place maybe where I could go visit a church that had an evening service. And I spent all afternoon looking for a place. Um, and uh, in the process of doing that, I came across a congregation that meets on Livingston Avenue. Uh, they didn't meet in the evening either, I don't believe. But uh, they had something called contact cards. And that rang a bell with me because of what Boyce had said in, in previous meetings, uh, business meetings, and uh, uh, now in the class, I knew this was going to be brought up. And uh, so <laughs> that is a congregation that has been known for evangelism for a long time. There was a congregation. The closest one I could find was Claremont, but by the time I found it, it was too late for me to drive that far to go. It was on the other side of Orlando, and I was on the East Coast, um, literally on, on the East Coast. So wasn't able to, to, to visit there. I would have loved to have done that. Um, preacher there I've known for a really a long time. Um, Tuesday, that's the reason for the timing of this whole trip. Um, my uh, brother Tom and his wife Joy, they've had six children of their own, then they adopted five more after that. And uh, the first two they adopted were uh, a couple born in Guinea, that's a country in Africa, and um, they've been with them for a good long while. I didn't quite get, I, I hadn't, I think it's 13 years now, because Andrew told me he's 15 years old and he was two when he was adopted. And, and so that means Aminata was, I think, five. Um, and uh, so she got married, met somebody at Florida College. Uh, it turns out Braden, I didn't know this till the trip was nearly over, he was the guy that visited the congregation in New Smyrna Beach that I mentioned earlier where we first went. Sherry, uh, was a good friend of uh, Ellen's, was there, and it was her first chance to be with her after she lost her husband a year and a half ago. Last time she went was right at two years ago uh, for her birthday, and uh, Sam passed away four months after that uh, two years ago. Uh, Wednesday, the next day after the wedding, uh, and meeting quite a few of Tom's uh, co-workers and friends, um, church members and all, family, lots of family from all around. He has 17 grandchildren. Um, 
we had uh, dinner with uh, Christopher's mother, Wendy, uh, and she, her husband passed away a couple years ago, and um, her new husband, she remarried since then. His name is Freddie Newman. Uh, he was just, he tried out at New Smyrna and, and, uh, um, and wound up uh, being invited to uh, work with another congregation in Northeast Florida, and that is Middleburg. It's a town southwest of uh, Jacksonville. I've known about this congregation since I was in Daytona. I never got to meet the, the preacher who had a lot of influence and the evangelism that was done in that congregation, but I know this guy tried to have at least eight Bible studies a week with people, and uh, uh, his name is, his was Rick's, Rick Billingsley, and then uh, later a fellow named Denny Freeman worked there, and when Denny worked there, he started a prison ministry. I, I kind of had one when I was in Daytona uh, with a, a prisoner who was locked up, and one then obeyed the gospel at, at, in, in that time, but um, Jerry Crolius, who was preaching in um, French Street, and that's a congregation that supports me, they, um, he, 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 he moved down there uh, to work with the congregation, but they also had a fellow named Daryl Townsend. I knew his oldest brother, who was a member at, at Hot Springs when I was preaching there in the early 80s. Uh, well, Daryl's the youngest in that family, and uh, wonderful personal worker, uh, wonderful fellow, and uh, he actually got involved in prison work and actually runs a halfway house, in other words, for people who are transitioning out of prison, and the church has a lot of interaction with these people, uh, and uh, some people wonder, well, do they all, you know, stay faithful afterwards? No, they not all do, but there are success stories, and one success story involves another preacher who was invited to work there. So now we got three guys working full time in this congregation, uh, Jerry um, and Daryl, who are also elders in the congregation now. But but um, then you have uh, them inviting a, another one, Greg Whipple, who had been converted by somebody I knew uh, in in Rhode Island uh, quite a while back, and uh, he was also interested in foreign evangelism. And I had some correspondence with him, but but he wound up working. Uh, with the congregation there, and uh, then they invited Freddie to, to work up there, and uh, things um, are, are going really well there, let's just put it that way, and um, then later the same day, uh, had dinner with Kevin and Sherry Kelly, and uh, we talked about uh, the work of the congregation where they go, uh, Temple Terrace, it's a congregation where they basically have 600 people. And when I was telling somebody about this, they have 13 elders, 600 members, or six, maybe 600 attendants. Uh, is this a conservative church? And it is. Um, Kevin was an elder in the congregation at, at Hot Springs when he was there. Um, and he's just a regular member, uh, been there for, 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 for a couple of years now. But uh, it, it's... Um, Amazing the stuff that he was telling me that, that, that the, the, there's always people who they would try to find things for people to do and there's lots to do because there's a lot of people, a lot of interaction, a lot of uh, closeness and one of the guys was joking about how it is the biggest small church he's ever seen. What they mean by small church is people who actually do know each other. Uh, so even if you can have a large congregation, it is possible to know each other and have that love uh, that was mentioned earlier in the class in the importance of showing our love for one another. The disciples, you know, when it first began, the first day, there were 3,000, and they had that love for each other, and it was evident to people who were not members. If you look at the very last part of chapter 2, it said that, you know, had favor with all the people because they saw the love that ha uh, Christians had for one another. And uh, so... One of the things is that they get together for Thursday morning breakfast. Some of the guys, not all of them, obviously, but um, just just a small handful. And uh, so I just picked their brains because one who used to be an elder, um, he's 82 and no longer an elder there. Uh, well, how is it you do what you do? So he gave me several ideas. I'm not going to get into all those. Um, 
<clears throat> but going to go back to Wednesday for just a second. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to go worship uh, at 58th Street. That's where my brother preaches. Not because he he teaches a class there, but I knew with all his family members there, all his children, they were going to have a sing, <laughs> and I, I couldn't miss that. And Tom did. He got he got sick, and his wife did. But uh, um, so they stayed home. But but the rest of them were there. And uh, Travis Bethany's husband is one that planned uh, this this song service. And uh, there was an intern at, at Fairview uh, last year, and uh, he, he was also there because that's where he attended, and he had to go to a wedding. It's hard to think of a, somebody having a wedding on a Tuesday instead of a weekend, but, but uh, that was the only time one of the groomsmen could make it. Uh, he, Brent uh, went to a wedding that happened on a Wednesday, and then he was at the, the, the church uh, for this singing and led a song uh, in, in this uh, service. Um, and to me, uh, and I asked Brent, you know, why did, why did you choose that congregation over, over uh, others? He said, because of the family atmosphere. And in the opening prayer, I heard the word family mentioned several times. I, I really like that. So I appreciate that. Um, the church is a family. And uh, so, you know, I know that because in the material, we, we covered that. But just covering it, you know, you can know it in a more profound way by experience or by seeing the, the observation at a different congregation. Uh, and even, you know, having that connection, that, that kinship, because we all are bound by something more precious than family blood, and that is the blood of Christ. Isn't it true that his precious blood is, is of much greater value than, than physical blood that ties physical family members together? As Christians, that should be our perspective. And therefore, if the church is truly a, a family, we should treat each other as family and, and have that, that same closeness that we do with earthly family. And it's a blessing, a double blessing, if our earthly family members are also um, members of the body of Christ, the, the spiritual family as well. Um, and just to mention, for example... The family nature of, of our relationship. Just a simple verse like First uh, John chapter two, verses twelve through fourteen uh, says, "I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. I write to you, fathers. Doesn't say old men, like little children, old men. It says fathers. That's a family term. I write to you, fathers, because you've known Him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. And again, repeats those same three. Uh, phrases in in first john chapter 2 not only that but uh, we see that church leaders elders and deacons must first be tested they must first be successful family leaders according to first timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 for elders verses 8 through 13 for the deacons uh titus chapter 1 also makes the same point so the church is a family therefore the leaders of, of the congregation have to be family leaders first. Uh, so now we, we talk, I talk to them about things they do. It's, it's not expected that every member does the same thing. And that's, that's something that we also want to understand about reaching those who are lost um, and things we all can do to work together. We're all working for the same cause. That's important. Uh, we should help each other when we need help in doing our part in, in uh, fulfilling that purpose. Uh, that's what the congregation is for. I, I firmly believe the purpose of our assembly together is for edification. And um, the edification is to give us the strength, the courage, the wisdom, um, those things that, that we need to be equipped to minister, to, to reach the lost, uh, to, to set the right example and the doors of opportunity will open if we are living the way Jesus tells us to live. Thinking the way Jesus uh, tells us to think, it will just come out in, in our, the way we talk, uh, the way we, we act. Uh, but what we not do, <laughs> that the world does, uh, all of these things will cause people to wonder about us and ask questions. And we need to be ready to give an answer for the hope within us. That's 
uh, really what that is about. And just spending time together is part of this, Develop, developing ourselves, um, e encouraging uh, one another to um, do like what I've been doing with the Sunday morning lessons, except for this one. My wife was kind of disappointed I'm not doing one, um, you know, about, you know, a scripture a day for this week. But I I'm going to give you one. Wisdom, work on, on wisdom and start doing that, starting with the beginning of this month. Read one chapter of Proverbs a day. Now, June only has 30 days, and there are 31 chapters, so you double up on the last day. That's the way I've always done that. But start with chapter one, read a chapter a day, and daily renew your mind with wisdom that comes from God. So there, I got to throw it in, at least something there, uh, to renew your mind uh, for the next, well, for the next month. And you can even start today with uh, chapter 28 and, and, and then 29, 30, and 31. You don't have to wait till uh, the first to, to get started on that. But another lesson connected to, to this one is quite similar, and it has to do with our attitude toward people in general. Everybody is important. That's the point in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's not just a matter of it being, you know, uh, some members are more important than others, like uh, the guy who stands behind this uh, box here is more important because he's standing behind this box and there's a microphone on and, and all that. So he's to be heard. Of course, I'm supposed to be heard, but um, it's hard to edify if, I am, if I'm not understood or if I'm not heard. But everybody's important. Every part of the, the, the body is important. Um, any volunteers to get rid of any part of your body? You know, anybody have a knife where somebody wants to get rid of a part? I mean, that's not the way it works, is it? We all understand every part of our bodies are important. Now, when something gets really out of control, it might save the body to take that part out, like the appendix. You know, and if, if a member gets really out of control, and if it's a family member, there might need to be a timeout. You know, there's, there's discipline in to be in the congregation when it's necessary. But every member is important. And uh, we're all contributing to the good. And if not, then we need to, to deal with that. But First Corinthians 12 just makes that point. Whether you're one who thinks you're not as good as others or you are not needful of others, those are both greatly mistaken ideas, and those attitudes themselves will destroy unity. So it's important for us to recognize everybody is important in the body, 1 Corinthians 12. So we, we shouldn't look down on anybody just because they're a different part and have a different function in the body. Um, but more than that, we need to have the attitude of Jesus, which is that everybody is important, and that includes the lost. And the crowds were following, and they were like sheep that were scattered, having no shepherd. Uh, harassed, actually, uh, is the word there in, in Matthew 9, 36. And so he told the disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest. See, the, the, the workers are few. The harvest is plenty. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send forth laborers. Um, Jesus saw the need, and... If we are to pray in faith for laborers, are we not also going to, in faith, want to be a laborer? That's really the inference that he wants us to draw if we are thinking like Jesus. And remember, he died not only for our sins, he's the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Not just God loved the elect. Now, the elect are special because they are the ones who have responded to that offer of love and that grace, and they've responded in faith in the desire to become like Jesus. Um, that's why we're precious to him. But everybody in the world, made in his image, he sent his son to die for each and every one, and we need to have the same attitude for the loss that Jesus has. Else, is Christ really living in us? Uh then we went to Eagle Lake. This is where Papa was born. Uh, visit all his relatives. 
we picked out a, well, it turns out to be a stone that was from Norway. And since he preached in Norway for five years, we thought that'd be a great way to commemorate uh, um, that and uh, put that. And, and so that will be done. And uh, it went until Monday that I actually uh, got the, the tools to, to put the remains of uh, Mimi and Papa or Ellen's mom and dad, Carol's mom and dad, um, to the ground. One of the thoughts that, that, that I thought I had such great appreciation for in that whole process, it, it was not something I was looking forward to, but glad to have accomplished it. But I am so grateful that they were the kind of parents that they were, that they had the, the three children that they had. I, I think that this becomes the, the thing, uh, reminds me of a verse, I think it's in Proverbs 27, 10. You know, he, he tells his, his son to behave himself so that he might have an answer to him that, you know, reproaches him or whatever. Uh, our children um, are, are going to be the lasting legacy of, of, of who we are and the effect that we have in this world. Um, and then Saturday, I... Uh, I had, kind of had a break. I, I actually, there was a puzzle, and it wasn't done. And I thought, hey, I, I may be, be able to get this done. And while I was doing this puzzle, I heard Aunt Jean on the phone calling so many people. He, she was working the phone. You know, people who were not at church, I mean, she, she really knows how to work the phone. And, and every conversation, she'd at least say at least once, I love you. And I, I just thought that was great. And I, 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 I'm going to try to be more, more like that. She's somebody who sees that the telephone's a way you can encourage people literally daily. Back then, I think they lived closer together than they could see each other daily and encourage each other. We all need encouragement. And that's the thing we need to understand as body, members of the body. We are all in need of help of one another. Um, then that Sunday, which was last Sunday, we worshiped at Edgewood because Brent Forsyth was the preacher there, but well, he was in Romania. I found that out the previous Sunday from uh, uh, Mar Marianne and Gabby at New Smyrna. But we went to see a couple who'd been there over there a lot of times, uh, the Franklins, and uh, Brent's wife, Ta Tamara, was there and happened to sit right behind her that, without knowing that that's who was sitting in front of us. Um, but we heard good news about Constanza. Oh, yeah, Constanza's doing great. Uh, that just made my heart feel great. Like John said, there's no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth, Third John. Um, that's how I felt. And then it, it was doing well in Bucharest as well, and it even in other part, parts in Romania. Um, we also heard a real good talk on the Lord's Supper. They had the prolonged service. They didn't have the evening service. Um, he had a really good long talk, he, he, and he said things in the way he put it. Uh, it was a lesson from uh, Luke 24. Disciple, Jesus talked to the disciples after he rose from the dead, you know, all on the road to Emmaus. Uh, and so made, made some good uh, thoughts there in that lesson. And, of course, the resurrection is part of what we should remember because it's the day of the week that we remember is the commemoration of his resurrection, uh, which gives us the understanding that, that, yes, he died for our sins. And so the, the emblems are, are having to do with the uh, body and the blood of Jesus. And his willingness to share, become partakers of flesh and blood as we are partakers of flesh and blood. So he had fellowship in our nature, uh, and that's the sacrifice he made in, in dying for us as well. And so the day he arose is significant when it comes to that. So with all of that, uh, you have um, really a really good lesson. But uh, um, after that, there was a sermon about, and it's a guy who is an economist by, by trade, his secular job, but he preaches part-time. Um, and he talks about leading economic indicators, and he took that principle and he applied it to spiritual things, spiritual indicators. Um, and he talked about how to determine that you can make a better spiritual future for yourself and that's by spending time with brethren, attending, um, reading God's word, and, and praying. Um, then I, after service is over, I found out this guy who had given the talk of the Lord's Supper 
he had been in an accident and he nearly died. I remember a couple of the members said the, 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 there was a guy in that congregation who, who got hurt real bad and he, he nearly died. And, and, and so uh, a lot of prayer for him. So I commented about his uh, talk afterwards and, and, uh, oh, and he, you know, I, I mentioned something about, you know, the act, there was an accident. Somebody said you, you had been in an accident. I thought it had been like two to five years ago. He said that's three weeks ago. This is I'm like wow. <laughs> yeah, he believes in the power of prayer, <laughs> and that's a, a great testimony. Uh, how we should believe as well. There were a lot of people who prayed for him. They they thought he was going to die, but he didn't. And then three weeks later, he's giving a talk for Lord's Supper, which is about as long as the sermon was. Uh, God requires sacrifice from us. That's that's one of the big ones. Um, Romans chapter 12, we're to be living sacrifices. Uh, this is to be applied to marriage, and that was on my mind a lot. I went down for a wedding. I heard a great lesson. Uh, you know, Tom does great weddings. That's all I can say. And it's very emotional when he has to give away the person that he's doing the ceremony for, and that's happened three times now. Um, but we are to sacrifice in marriage that's that it's not going to succeed if we don't and i need to do better um we need to sacrifice in our families fathers are to provide for for their household first timothy chapter 5 verse 8 we're to sacrifice in the church if the church is to succeed we all must sacrifice to the degree that we do the the body will grow that's what ephesians 4 verse 16 says and i'm glad we got to read the whole thing at the beginning of of the worship service because it, it is a work of ministry that all saints are to be furnished to do and every part does its share to its effort that's that's the strength of the church and that's what temple terrorists has seemed to do uh, with their elders organizing people to get involved even if it's to go to somebody's house and play games once a week you know get to know each other and uh, they, they switch up uh, who gets with who, you know, throughout throughout the year. Um, and, of course, with self-control, it, that takes sacrifice. Self-control itself is sacrifice and, and part of the fruit of the Spirit, as Galatians 5.23 says. And um, one thing that just kind of sums up all of this um, to me is that there has to be an emotional investment. You know, like Boyce was saying about the contact cards to show our concern. If the concern is only on paper, and if it's not genuine, it's, it's, it's going to, to be exposed at some point, or subconsciously people will realize it's not real. And, and obviously the church is not going to succeed if it is not emotionally invested in all relationships, even with your neighbors, as well as one another, uh, and, and every relationship requires sacrifice, requires effort, and that means emotional and mental as well as physical or financial. But Jesus did talk about financial in, in Luke 16. These lessons were not lessons, well, I never knew that the church was a family. No, we know these things. We know them intellectually, but, but because of the events, you know, now they're clarified in my mind. Um, you know, because of, of these various circumstances. I had a time, I had a chance to do a lot of thinking. And so here's the, here's the last lesson. I am not ready to die. This might sound crazy, but I thought I was ready to die. If the Lord is to come, I'm ready. But now I don't feel like I'm ready to die. I'll tell you why. My house is not in order. He hit the felt, he put his house in order, then he hanged himself. So putting your house in order doesn't necessarily mean you're doing the wisest thing. He was a wise man in one sense, but uh, he, he, he had other things that were wrong, and, and that's not good. But uh, the idea of putting your house in order is that you make sure what is going to happen after you die, you got that planned out, and you have no control. Uh, you can control who inherits what you, you leave behind, but you can't control what they do with what they inherit, and that's what Ecclesiastes talks about. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about my house is not in order. I'm not... I think my family wouldn't be prepared if, if I was to be gone right now. Maybe that's the only reason God let me to stay, stay this long until I get that right. I still have work to do 
for the church to be set in order. Titus 1 talks about that. And I know that because we don't have elders. There's work to do, you know, to, to put, put in order the things that are lacking. And Titus 1 talks about that. So there are things that I, I feel like that I, I need to be doing more of before I'm ready to die. And, and myself is not in order. I mean, you know, to meditate on these things and let your progress be evident to all. Um, I need to be growing spiritually. I need to be working on myself more. And I would encourage each and every one of us to do the same. We need to uh, focus on ourselves to be strong enough to be able to help one another. And, and so that's why I'm saying I'm, I'm not ready to die. But the question now comes, are you ready to die? You know, the one who, who dies in their sins, he's lost. And it is a point man wants to die. That, that's something that has become really clear in my mind. And a whole bunch of other things um, thought about uh, since I had the time to do so. Uh, and we do need time to think, and we, do, we should do that. But Jesus became the author of eternal salvation by the things that he suffered. Uh, he overcame all that, and he is the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. And, of course, to receive his grace, we need to be one that has our hearts cleansed with the sprinkling of the blood of Christ because our bodies have been washed in, in pure water. That is, we've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, then raised to walk in newness of life. We're to, we're to do that. So if you're one who needs to make your life right with the Lord, we encourage you to come forward as we stand this song to invite you. If you need the prayers of the congregation, we encourage you to come forward now while we stand and sing. Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the way.